Merry Christmas! This is the Athletic Old Mint's Christmas gift to you. Isn't that right, Bob? What is it? It's a compilation of all the songs that have graced the podcast in the last few months, but without some of the ones that didn't really work all that well. All right, well, I can I'll, I can add a new one to it. I'm going to do a medley for you, Andy, right? Are you? A medley of, I think it's 70s music, right? Sitting in the back row of the movies on a Saturday night with you. Say you'll meet me down on the beach tonight And you and me can dance the night away Hey girl, don't bother me Hey girl, don't bother, don't bother me girl Go away, come back another day Don't that, bother me That was lovely. Thank you. That was lovely and welcome to Christmas. I want to ask you a couple of questions before um, we, we have the first selection of songs. Um... What first attracted you to singing, Bob? Did you sing as a boy in Middlesbrough, or was that the kind of thing generally considered for sissies? Um, I was born into in Middlesbrough, which is known as Soul Town. Soul, <laughs> oh yeah, funny. Sorry, yeah. Um, David Coverdale, Chris Rea, Paul Rogers, and me were, I promise, born within about a two, three hundred yard radius. It's a magic quadrangle, yeah. Right. Beautiful voices. Um, so yeah, I was destined to sing. Okay. Obviously. And it's took you this long for it to become. No, I'll be vaguely perfect, popular. Uh, no, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Is um, one of my elder brothers was in the band with David Coverdale called Rivers Invitation, then came right. on to be Tramline. Right. Um, and David Covered David Coverdale, one I got singer really. Can I just stop you there because I think yeah. people want to hear the songs. I don't want to hear about David Coverdale. Well, you asked me what I did, I, but I thought you'd like answer it quite briefly. All right. What, what did you, what was your question? I'll give you a brief answer. I think you've already answered it. What first attracted you to singing? I I I, I love singing. I hate instrumentals. I just love the spoken sing yeah, songs. Like the human song. voice in yeah. your ears. Yeah. Right. Well, here's a selection of some of the songs you've done on the podcast. Hold on a minute. If this is to be worth what you're just going to play songs. It's what they've asked for. People yeah. have said, when will you do a compilation of the songs? All right. And then some of them are followed up with, for fuck's sake, don't do any talking in between them. Ah, uh, well then I apologise. So here's some of them now. I'm just a little bird whose leg got bust by a bottle that was thrown into my favourite bush. I've got a lovely smile and a winning face. All the other birds think I'm a fucking disgrace. <laughs> oh, just laugh at it. Right, well, I'm off, Andy. I thought that um, I would like to sing a song and then I would like to sing a sort of tribute to the big girls. Fat lasses that we often mention on here. I call them love puddles. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, there's often just a, like a put if when they sit, sit on a bed, it's a bit like a head with a puddle. A puddle of sweat. Puddle, well, a puddle of flesh. So I'll sing, and it's a tribute to them and what they bring to us. So um, here we go. Love puddles, the clouds of love, the puffball mushrooms from heaven above, floating harbours of porcelain hue, the boudoir angels will comfort you. They're waiting, flowing free, undulating constantly. Love puddles the clouds of love, the puffball mushrooms from heaven above. I'm just a little mouse whose face got bent when a trap malfunctioned and crushed a quarter of me head. I've got one bulbous eye and a knackered lip. And all the other mice think I'm a fucking prick. <laughs> On a plane with Didier Drogba, he was watching Mrs. Doubtfire. He laughed so hard, his gloves flew off and landed in my fucking cannelloni. And landed in my fucking cannelloni. 
Noel Edmonds lit my fire. He turned me on and spat me out. He made me his bitch with his love machine. That beard, those shirts, that hair, that belt. If you loved him forever, then you'd know how I felt. Yeah, Noel Edmonds, he lit my fire. I've got a song. What I was tr- can I just explain? What I was going here for was like more of a, a party, um, sort of late night party vibe. Yeah. A really up. Lionel Richie dancing on the La- ceiling kind of thing. Up. Thank you, yeah. Andy. Exactly that yeah. sort of vibe, OK? Yeah. So, here we go. Imagine synthesizers, dancers and everything, yeah, OK? Yeah. Right, so it goes. <laughs> bright colours, bright fucking lights. Sexy ladies in expensive tights. Coca-Cola, Bonoffi pie. The kind of party you won't survive. For forest creatures, entry is free. But if you're human, it's 30p. Bright colours, bright fucking lights. That's some songs. Now then, Bob, you've done some songs about Steve McLaren, which we're going to hear in the next section of songs. Yeah. Now, the overriding f- feeling I get from your McLaren work is that you harbour a lot of resentment towards him, possibly jealousy. Would you say that's fair? I reject that accusation. I'm very, very fond of what Steve McLaren did for Middlesbrough Football Club. Yeah. Right. But just as a character, I do find him slightly up um, slightly insipid I think that um, just like Bergerac the Jersey detective if you were to smell his bare flesh he would smell of biscuits yeah do you know what I mean yeah um, and I do honestly believe that in his heart of hearts he prefers carpeting to football right and it's nothing to do with the fact that he's got a better hair island than you and you feel jealous I of don't that. have an hair island I've got a great big lake at the back a lagoon well you know you'd like to have a hair island wouldn't you you yearn for the days when you used to have a hair island. That's what's at the crux of all this. Is it a hair thing? Jealousy. I think so. And anyway, let's hear some of your Steve McLaren songs. Oh, where'd you get your shirt, Steve? It looks fucking incredible. The big glass bought me it from BHS. If you don't mind me saying, Steve, it makes you look fucking sexy. Thank you, Bob. That's what the fat lass said. How would you describe it to those who can't fucking see it? It's a light blue short-sleeved comfort fit. The colour and the detail really pick out your arm freckles. That's not freckles, Bob. It's dried on pieces of fucking snake sick. <laughs> There you go. Well, I've got a song. I mean, I kind of got a song. It was just, it actually came out of the DJ session that Roy oh, right, yeah. and um, Steve had at the house. And it goes, if you remember, it's, we got a brand new convoy. That's mm-hmm. the tune, all right? So um, theirs was a little bit more jazzy, had all the sort of sounds mixing and all that. But I'll just sing it like the original. Right, or Right, oh, so... Fat lass bought me a short sleeve, it's a plain blue comfort fit. It came with two spare buttons and a voucher for some wicker shit. Then Roy comes in, yeah? Fat lass bought him a short sleeve with sweat holes in each pit. It better be quick dry nylon, cause it's covered in reptile sick. Casper, I love you, we were touch tight every night. Casper, I miss you. You were there when I bought the waffle maker. Oh, Casper, there is a piece of sick that you left behind on the kitchen blind. And every time I see it, a tear falls on the kitchen floor where you danced like a troubadour. Casper, I'll remember you for the good times, not just the spew. Casper, we'll meet again and we'll be touch tight in the afterlife. Casper, I loved you. 
Listeners of Athletic Gold Mints can get up to £60 deposit match when you use the promo code MINS10. Just visit betonbrazil.com and enter promo code MINS10 on your first deposit and BetOnBrazil will match your deposit up to £60. Also look out for betonbrazil.com's daily happy hour offers between 5pm and 6pm. Sign up now at betonbrazil.com. Charity bet time. Right, listen to this. Manchester City yeah. Champions League winners. I'll go for that, yeah. I think it could happen. Pep could like tell sort them the, out. Tell me what the odds are. At the moment, eight to one. Oh, that's all right. You should put a ten on. Or oh, what yeah. about Atletico Madrid? Also eight to one. Um, Which of those two do you reckon is most likely? Uh, well, Atletico Madrid, to be honest with you. You reckon? Yeah. Can we have a five or each on them? Yeah, five or each. Of them all right, away. we've done that then. Over 18s only. Offer is for new customers only. Terms apply. Betting should be fun, so please gamble responsibly. <laughs> We're gonna have some more songs now. And this next selection includes some of my songs that I've done, so I'm very, very sorry about that. I'd like to sing me song. Well, I've got a song as well, so we could have a song off. You've got a song? Do mine first? Let's have a little sing song. Let's hear yours first. Do you want to introduce it? Here we go. What is it, Come fry with me, let's fry, yeah, fry away. Delicious fare, all fried with hot air. I can shove it in your face. You can eat it all, or else I'll fucking spark you out. Come fry with me, let's fry, yeah, fry away. Chicken dips, mini pizzas, and a carrot, yeah! Yeah! I was lost in France Without chicken dippers or a chance of romance Feels like I'm lost in time I've eaten so much jambon that I've started pissing brine Yes, I'm lost in France Baristas, set in the scene Baristas Dishing out cream, baristas! Pumping all the levers and the gears of baristing machines. Baristas, dripping with sweat, baristas! Getting me wet, every fucker wants to be a sister or a Mr. Barista! Baristas, got it all going on, baristas, got me singing the song, gonna with a lot of so I can buy myself my own barista! Yeah! What it is, is I've done a song to the tune of Ghostbusters because of Ghostbusters right. coming out, all right? All right, yeah. So I'll give it a go. If you do it and it's a load of shite, I'll just cut it out and we'll pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, well, I'll leave it to your judgment, Andy. Right. I think it probably go is for a it, bit then. shite, right? So it's Ghostbusters, yeah? Yeah. When you're down in the dumps because your snake spewed up, who are you going to call? The Dirty Alderman. You could have done that bit with me. Well, I didn't know what you were going to say. Okay, sing. so start again. When you're down in the dumps, because your snake spewed up, who are you going to call? The dirty, dirty old man. When you're facing defeat and it's a kiss you need, who are you going to call? The dirty, dirty old, old man. man. Fucking hell, son, you're joking. Aren't you get a group? This soup is shit and the Geordies are in the championship. When you're feeling shite, because you're Chadwick's light, who are you going to kiss? The dirty, dirty old, old man. man. There you go. Yay. Um, I don't know if I'll keep that in, to be honest. It wasn't great. Yeah, I'd rather you didn't. Thank you. I'm Greg off the TV. I spell it with an extra G. I'm the king of Master Chef. Completely. Ba 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 ba. But it leaves me feeling low I don't even trust to road Think he wants to overthrow And destroy me I eat hot dogs Legs of frogs But I feel nothing Hot dogs Roasted hogs I feel nothing My new wife's 29 Wakes me up at half past five. I feel like I want to die by tea time. My fans are all impressed. I've got them eating well for less. But my head's a fucking mess. Please help me. I eat hot dogs, drink eggnog, but I feel nothing. Hot dogs, chocolate logs. 
feel nothing. Nothing. I feel nothing. Sly Stallone is all alone. Sly Stallone is in his home. He's all alone. Sly Stallone, he's been eating a potato. Suddenly he wakes up and stares at the potato, then turns on the TV, then looks at the potato. He changes the channel to homes under the hammer, then looks at his potato and touches the potato. Then mumbles evaluation, <laughs> one last look at potato, then falls back to sleep, cause Sly Stallone is in his home, Sly Stallone is all alone, he's been eating a potato. <laughs> well, you can check it out if you want, Andy. Okay, let's Right, well, this is a scene where Greg has discovered that he's got varicose veins. So it's quite poignant. Interesting. Poor Greg. He's got blue lines up and down his leg. The doctor says that they're just varicose veins. But he's in pain. Won't someone help poor Greg? Suddenly, Uh, Greg devises a swift remedy. Reaching for a nearby carving knife, he hacks at his thigh. <laughs> He's gone round the fucking bend. <clears throat> Why he amputated, I don't know, it makes no sense. I blame John Turrode, he's a terrible influence. Oh, oh, influence. Who are Greg? Lying there covered in his own blood. Uh-huh. It's just no good. He's cut off his fucking leg. Fucking leg. That's it. Lovely man in Asta, waiting for the chicken to be reduced. If you grab the piri piri drumsticks before me, I'll break your fucking neck. I will break your fucking neck. There we go. Yellow label hour. Mm. Summed up in song. Bob, your Scottish dirges yes. have become inexplicably popular with listeners of the podcast. And um, that leads me to suspect that a large portion of our fans detest themselves and their own lives. Right. Um, can you confirm the allegation that you've received a five-figure sum from the elders of the Outer Hebrides as a bung? For you to record these songs? No bungs. Uh, um, actually, no comment. <laughs> no comment. No, you said no bungs, and then you said no comment. No bungs, no comment. I've been told it's That's part... That's going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> no bungs, no comment. <laughs> I've been told it's part of a campaign they're running called Be Afeard of the Mainland, which they're running in order to halt the dwindling population numbers. Andy, it's soft propaganda. Soft propaganda. What does that mean? call it. It means propaganda that's so, it's on Twitter, it's on podcast shit like this, you know what I mean? But it, it sort of like, you know, pervades, is that a word yeah. or is that a dish? So are you confirming or denying you've been paid by the elders of the Outer Hebrides to... In all comment. Okay, let's have some of the Scottish dirges then. I've written something that's a bit more, de- it's a bit depressing actually, it's a bit down, Scottish sort of song. Mm. But it's a Scottish baker sort of song. I'm a Scottish baker, I bake the Scottish pies. I've got problems with my drainage and problems with my wife. The two may be interconnected, cause I bludgeoned her to death by repeatedly hitting her head with my welder's mask. I disposed of her flesh and bones down the back kitchen sink. Now my toilet's blocked and my pie meat's starting to stink. That will be 40p, Mr Mackay, and I would eat it before sunset if that was my pie. (laughs) 
This is the tale of Michael Mowbray, a man born and bred. Sorry, this is the tale of Michael Mowbray, a man born on a bed of scouring powder, and be hidden of a heart of pure stone. On his eighteenth birthday, he announced a barn dance. The price of admission included a free artisan hamburger and an amusing badge. The whole island came, apart from Harry McKay, who had a trumpet stuck up his arse from efforts to blow out an unruly tod. Oh, you've got to stick with it, Andy. You'll get rid of it if it's shit, won't you? Yeah, yeah, right. so, yeah, An unruly tod, an unruly tod. On the count of midnight, <laughs> Michael Mowbray called for silence. <laughs> hey, you bastards, he growled. You know those artisan hamburgers? Aye, we do, Michael. Well, they were near artisan, but frozen ones from Aldi on the mainland. The more fragile in the audience dropped to their knees in pain, whilst those of a firmer bollock twisted their faces in temper. But Michael just smiled as he left the barn and tossed a flaming truncheon into its belly. Eighty lives were lost. Eighty lives were lost. Eighty lives were lost. And now only Michael and Mr. McKay reside on that godforsaken island. And what about Mr. McKay's difficult Todd? And what about Mr. McKay's difficult Todd? It fell out exactly one year to the night of the barn dance and is now kept in a box with various other difficult items. With various other difficult items. Oh, that's it, Andy. I'm sorry. Right. Just um, nip it out or whatever. I'll edit it out, yeah. This is the tale of Sam McGregor, the last surviving adult male on the island. He had long harboured dreams of escaping to the mainland where he could sample the pastry at Greg's or visit Costa Coffee where you could apply within. Even enroll at a Bannatine or pure living gym and cleanse his body with their luxury soaps. He had planned his escape for some time, but things had now turned urgent. As in the last month, 80 men had died. 80 men had died. Yes, 80 men had died. He fashioned the durable craft from firewood and discarded fencing. Oars were made from that little access panel you find on lampposts that he prized off with a large hinge from his mother's blanket box. It was past midnight when he dropped... Is my accent going? No, it's really good, strong. It was past midnight when he dropped his boat into the water and climbed down the quayside ladder. Just as he placed his boot into the boat, he heard the water roll and lap, and there by the side of the boat was a large fish swimming upon its back. As the moonlight adjusted his eye, he saw that the fish had the face of Brian McDermott. The face of Brian McDermott. The face of Brian McDermott. What do you want of me, horrible fish? Just let me pass on my way to the mainland. There's no escape from the island without consequence. Just look at the fucking state of me. You must return to your mother right away, boy, said the fish. If you're not back by her side within an hour, then she will suffer a fate far worse than that which has been opposed upon me and my shoal. Sam stared at the surface of the water, and everywhere he looked were fish with the face of Brian McDermott, the face of Brian McDermott, the face of Brian McDermott. Sam climbed up the ladder and ran at all his speed across the barren moors. Just over the hour had elapsed when he entered his mother's bedroom. She appeared to be sound asleep. He placed his hand on her shoulder to check for warmth, when suddenly she turned and stared at him fully. The fish was no fibbing. Her fate was worse than theirs. 
She had the face of Louis van Gaal. The face of Louis van Gaal. The face of Louis van Gaal. This is the tale of Stuart McDermott, a tall, wiry boy of little conversation, but plenty thought. Thought, not lonely, but always on his own. Not depressed, but reflective and gentle in his manner. Like most of the younger men on the island, he dreamt every day of leaving to start life on the mainland. There was only himself and three other males surviving on the mull, for in the previous nine months, thirteen men had died. Thirteen men had died. When he imagined life on the mainland, he saw himself striding into Thompson's hail bar and demanding that his shoes be reshod on one of their complicated revolving machines, or whistling at the lasses as they gathered around the bollards preventing vehicles entering the housing estate. He even saw himself sat in Coster Coffee, drinking hot chocolate, and been handed the Wi-Fi code by the lassie with tats to spell. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, for several years, Stuart had been researching the geology of the small island <laughs> and inquiring of the older generation about the infamous Hellpot Hole. It was reputed to be the home of an unusual beast with whom a deal could be struck to escape the clutches of the godforsaken isle. His research had led him to a small... <laughs> His research had led him to a small inlet, confusingly absent from all maps and records, and fenced off with barbed wire on which locals had hung various charms and warning birds. <laughs> But his desire to leave was strong, <laughs> and so, and so he tunnelled under the barrier using the egg, using the exhaust pipe from a Lambretta scooter that had dropped out of a plane and landed on the moors, killing a man on impact. As he clambered down the hinny to the entrance of the Hellpot Hole, he felt a fear and foreboding usually reserved for those who dared to stroke a bull's balls with a fistful of nettles. <laughs> Entering the cave, he was immediately struck by the spent stench of boiled onions, and sure enough, he quickly saw a figure bent over a large cooking pot, stirring onions in a rolling boil of water. The figure was naked but covered in hair, a branch snapped, beneath his feet, and he, the figure slowly turned its head toward him. Stuart made to run, but his feet were now stuck by a sticky substance that was leaking from the base of the onion pot. The beast was now fully turned, and Stuart whimpered as he saw that it had the face of Benny Hill. <laughs> the face... <laughs> the face of Benny Hill! The face of Benny Hill! Do you like boiled onions? said the beast. I fucking do. In fact, I can he get enough of the wee sweet bastards. The beast plucked an onion out of the pot and held it unscalded in his hand as he approached Stuart with the onion held the front of him. I sense you want to leave the island, boy. I, I do, said Stuart. You'll be wanting to visit Thompson's to have a key cut on their complicated machine. Another such mainland nonsense, I guess. Aye, that's right, said Stuart. We'll take a bite of the onion child. I will assure you passage through Hellpot and on to a series of chambers to the mainland. But there is a price to be paid. I'll pay that price, said Stuart, and he grabbed the onion and bat on to it. As he chewed, the beast held up a gilded mirror for Stuart to gaze upon. And what he saw brought about his instant demise, simply from the shock of it. He had the face of Louis Suarez. The face of Louis Suarez. The face of Louis Suarez. 
And that's the end of the tale of Stuart. I'm going to keep this short, Bob. It's almost 2017. You need to make smart decisions. After picking up over 100,000 members, Cornerstone are now so confident that once men try their razor and shaving products, they won't go back to their old razor. They'll chuck it in the bin. So now you can get an award-winning razor from just £4, and that's with £10 off. Just visit cornerstone.co.uk slash mints, or visit cornerstone.co.uk and enter code mints at checkout to get started. 100,000 men. Can you imagine 100,000 men? That's like what Wembley Stadium used to hold. 100,000 100,000 men. 100,000 men. Drunk. All brandishing razors. Fair enough, Andy. You know, Cornerstone. And I'm looking at you and, Jesus Christ, you need a shave. I do need a shave, So yeah. why are you being poo-pooish about this? I'm not being poo-pooish. It I'm... seems like you are. You can cut out the middleman. There's no middleman when I a buy smooth, it. smooth, comfortable shave. Well, if there is... Oh. Six blades! Here's the last collection of songs from this Christmas compilation we've done for you. Enjoy. This is the tale of Murray Sterling. <laughs> His 18th birthday was fast approaching and he knew he must escape the clutches of the island before that date or be forced to spend the rest of his adult life in the caves neath the island digging for precious stones to adorn the laird's numerous ceremonial capes and his bongos. His dream was to start a new life on the mainland. Many times he imagined himself wearing the orange and blue tabard of the B&Q organisation guiding customers towards the wallpaper paste or replacement fence panelling, laughing with colleagues in the staff room as they chatted to each other through short lengths of drainpipe. Sometimes he saw himself in Café Nero buying a guest bean cappuccino and requesting an extra shot from a waitress with plenty of tit. And for sure, he would submit the relevant forms to gain residence rights at Oak Furniture Land with that portly man and his dozy son and enjoy the cosy wooden lifestyle it offered. But for now, he needed a boat, and that was an illegality on the island. The laird employed a giant of a man, known only as the boatman. He would search the island every day for evidence of boat building and smash what he found with his spiked iron ball and chain. The boatman's face was always covered with a hessian hood, but it was said that underneath he had the face of thirteen chickens. The face of thirteen chickens! The face of thirteen chickens! But Murray had been clever. He had assembled his craft inside the old lighthouse a place that no other, including the boatman, would trespass, for it was reputed to be the home of mainland Mary, a spectre similar to the Lamnia that would devour you with pure buttery love. Murray knew that such talk was bullwater, so had used the lighthouse as a safe haven to build his boat. The night arrived and Murray entered the lighthouse and began to untether his hand-built boat that he had fashioned from hardened turkey tods joined together with (laughs) sticky glue. Suddenly the room was filled with a golden light and his heart was instantly filled with joy. A figure appeared in front of him, more beautiful than the very centre of desire. She wore a blue and (laughs) orange... She wore a blue and orange tabard and was seated in an oak dining chair. Beside her was an occasional table, again made of oak, and a a bookshelf made from imported oak. She had had cuts to spare and a bottom that stretched her full length. She slowly leaned forward to offer him a cappuccino, ready poured in a paper cup with a Wi-Fi code written upon it. Drink me, Murray, Murray, drink me. Drink me, Murray, Murray, drink me, she chanted. She was the mainland, and he wanted to reside within her. Then, boom, the door to the room burst open, and in strode the boatman. The vision of the lassie dissipated, and he was all alone and in fear. She gave your... Sorry, I changed my voice. She gave you a window into your life on the mainland. But that is all you will ever know of it. The boatman began to remove his hessian mask, and what Murray saw killed him in an instant. 
The boatman had the face of sixteen owls. The face of sixteen owls. This is the tale of Mary MacDougall. Mary was the youngest daughter of Thomas MacDougall, a farmer held in high regard on the island as its sole producer of turnips and sugar beets. Mary had inherited from her father an arse as wide as a sheep is long, but had plenty tit upstairs to compensate for any imbalance. Her skin was ruddy and well-tempered, due to a weekly soak in a tub of turnip water, heated to lukewarm but no further. It was the week of her 18th birthday, the date on which she must become the bride of the island laird. Her duty to serve him both in toil and passion, her fate to never leave the laird's castle and bathe in sweet turnip water again. It was Mary's duty to forgo her freedom or suffer the pain of forced labour in the caves neath the island. All other lasses had forbear the same fate, but Mary was no ordinary lass. Mary dreamed of escaping to the mainland, the bustling artisan coffee shops with bearded proprietors, housing estates with no through roads where a traveller's only option was to make a three-point turn if sucked into its grip. Wi-Fi hotspots available for free on the registration of a few simple details. She saw herself rushing to the 24-hour copy shop in Stranra to obtain a large photocopy of her favourite dog to hang on the wall of her new accommodation. When asked what size she required, the laddie would blush as a request for a big one though it would be clear from his awkward stance that he was possessed of a long and stout personal pipe. (laughs) There was only one plan that could see her dreams fulfilled, and that was to murder the laird. But the laird was guarded 24 hours a day by Pet Mare, a beast part wolfhound, part pig, and part generic animal, but worst of all reputed to have... The face of Ollie Murs. <gasps> the face of Ollie Murs. The face of Ollie Murs. But in this respect, Mary had immunity, for she, unlike most of her race, had no fear of Murs. In fact, she was rather warm to the idea of taking the weight off his knacker back. Her plan was simple. On the night of their betrothal, she would hide a dagger in her girdle and plunge it into his heart as he clambered upon her. If need be, she could dispose of the beast pet mare by the same design. The night arrived and the laird clambered around her endless behind to position himself aside her. She could hear the rhythmic breath of pet mare beneath the bed and she knew that she must be swift and certain in her attack. The laird spoke. I'm about to rise up and clamber upon you. Should you refuse or impart any negative signs towards the act, you will be fed to the beast. Do you understand? I, I do, whispered Mary. The laird made a sudden move towards her girdle, and Mary found herself frozen as his hand chanced upon the dagger. He lifted it to the light and pronounced her fate. This one is for you, pet mare. Show her no mercy. Mary turned her head to address her fate, and what she saw killed her from shock in an instant. <laughs> the beast did no have the face of Ollie Mers, no, it was far more dastardly. It had the face of Honey G. The face of Honey G. The face of Honey G. <laughs> It was Christmas Eve on the island and young Callum McBride was full of wonder and hope for the following day would be the biggest day of his young life. His parents, on the other hand, were in a spirit of trepidation and fear. For you see, the laird had chosen their boy to be the centrepiece of his entertainment at his Christmas feast. And for that reason alone, they had decided to effect their son's escape to the mainland that very eve. (gasps) If they failed, then their precious son would be fetched at dawn by the laird's henchmen and taken to await his fate in the castle. Young Callum's mind was racing. He had often dreamed of life on the mainland. 
The Wonder of the Timpson's Heel Bar with its revolving machine and its intricate leather working tools. Not to mention its sweet smelling powerful glues that could work their magic on even the most absorbent of materials. He saw himself wearing a tight blue suit, two sizes too small for him, as was the fashion on the mainland, <laughs> and striding into Costa Coffee to demand their latest guest bean cappuccino. The waitress would be fulsome of tit and would seat him at a table where he could admire her curvature at leisure. Many times he had imagined himself dining at the latest pop-up restaurant a fusion of Turkish and Rastafarian peasant food, served on plasterboard with drill bits as cutlery. Occasionally he dared to imagine himself out on a date at Frankie and Benny's with the waitress from the coffee shop. At the bus stop following their burger meal, she would turn to him and say, Would you agree, young laddie, that I have plenty tit to spare? Aye, he would reply, there's many a helping there with leftovers for the poor of the parish. She would laugh and allow him a brief tap on the side of her bounty. <laughs> Fast forward to midnight. Callum and his parents cower on the beach as a small craft with a single lamp approaches. Get in, lad. We must make great haste, says the man in the boat. And he does get in, and his parents weep as they say goodbye, knowing that the laird would guillotine them for this offence. Three hours later, Callum stepped off the boat onto the shore. See that light there, said the boatman. That's my daughter. Go to her, and she will provide you safe harbour. Go on away you go. Callum approached the light and could never believe what he saw neath its glow. It was the girl from the coffee shop. Exactly as he had imagined her. He smiled an anxious smile as she put down her lamp and began to unbutton her blouse. When fully undone, Callum was faced with a sight that killed him instantly. <laughs> For her tits were not of the expected nature. They had embedded into them the faces of Andy Gray and Richard Keyes. <laughs> the faces of Gray and Keyes! The faces of Grey and Keys. Back on the shoreline, the boatman pulled back his hood and let out a cracker of a laugh. It was the laird. Merry Christmas, Callum, he whispered, and both he and the waitress disappeared in a puff of black smoke. The next day, Callum's parents received the news that their son had passed away on an island beach. For, you see, he had never left, and now he never would. There we are. That's our song compilation, our Christmas gift to you. A perfect collection of tunes that will enhance any Christmas or New Year gathering. Christmas lunch. Oh, don't put it on Christmas lunch. All right, not Christmas lunch. Maybe it's afterwards, after the Queen's speech, <laughs> instead of Top of the Pops. I tell you what, what does your root, I don't, does your bungalow, bungalow, yeah. reach incredible temperatures around about six o'clock on Christmas Day? Uh, it might do. No, I'm not only, but I, I'm not honestly. I'm not skilled for anything. I just sometimes reflect. I've had the meal, watching the telly, and that. Yeah. And think, shit, there's some heat being generated. Body heat, you think? Body heat. Must it can it's only a be body mixture heat. Mixture of the sprouts and the brandy, I reckon. Yeah, but our engines inside must be running. You know. Our hearts. Yeah, must be running, going bang, bang, a bang, boom, bang, a bang, and our stomachs, boom, bang, a bang, boom. Our pipes. Boom, Are you doing bang, another bang. song now? No, I just another free it, song. It just gets so hot, and it gets so tiring, doesn't it? But um, I, I'm I'm not glad to have contributed to this. Um, I hope you can see I'm sulking. I'm just looking at my phone all the time <laughs> to this so-called best of songs. It's what the people wanted, Bob. Who wanted it? Lots of people wanted it. If you're on Twitter and you follow us at Athletic or Mints, can you please tweet? I wanted the songs, and then I'll show them all. I'll show yeah. all the tweets to Bob. Yeah, I, I think the demand w w w was less than six. Right, well, we'll just see how it goes, shall we? Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs>